Hey folks, today on the Lincoln Project Podcast, we have a rare spoiler alert. Our guest today is Gabriel Sherman, the author of the phenomenal new movie, The Apprentice, which is about Donald Trump's younger years and his relationship with Roy Cohn, who shaped Trump's path to power and Trump's dark, twisted, and frankly, evil soul. But if you have not seen the movie yet, be advised, this contains heavy spoilers. And I mean a lot of heavy spoilers. If not, let's go. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. There is not a liberal America, any conservative America. There is the United States of America. Good night, and good luck. Hey, folks. Welcome back to the Lincoln Project Podcast. Our guest today is Gabriel Sherman. He is the author of the tremendous new film, The Apprentice. Hello, this is Donald Trump uh, from Mr. Cohn. Thank you so much. Donald who? One, two, three, four! Roy Cohn, nice to meet you. The Roy Cohn, you're brutal. Guilty as charged. (laughs) How do you always win? There's rules. The first rule is attack, attack, attack. It's gonna be the finest building in the city. Maybe, maybe the country. In the world. Rule two, admit nothing deny everything there's never been anything like this of this magnitude this quality who cheese balls over here what are you doing you want one no it looks totally disgusting cheese balls rule three no matter what happens you claim victory and never admit defeat you have to be willing to do anything to anyone to win you have a big ass you got to work on that your face looks like an orange Attack, attack, attack. Deny everything. Admit nothing. Never admit defeat. What if you lost your fortune today? Well, then maybe I'll run for president. I don't know. I say if you're indicted, you're invited. It is a history and a story of Donald Trump and his relationship with Roy Cohn. Many of you are too young to remember Roy Cohn. Hell, I'm too young to remember Roy Cohn. But it's a fascinating lesson in history. I want to welcome Gabriel to the show today. Um, Gabriel, talk to me about what inspired you to write The Apprentice and and how how your sort of revelations about Trump's character uh, developed as you wrote this book. Well, thanks, Rick, for having me. I'm a, I'm a political journalist in addition to being a screenwriter. Right. And um, this movie really owes... Um, its uh, origin to uh, my coverage of the 2016 presidential campaign. Mm -hmm. Um, I wrote, I covered the Trump campaign for, uh, at the time, New York Magazine. And I was struck by something people told me while I was covering the campaign. You know, Trump was, um, he was such a shock to the American political system. You know, nobody had had heard somebody, you know, speak um, basically with such demagoguery before and just the name calling the politics of personal destruction. And I was struck by things um, that people like Roger Stone told me, which Mm -hmm. is um, they would say things like, you know, he sounds a lot like Roy Cohn in these in these speeches, or he's just using the lessons Roy Cohn taught him. And um, it just came to me one day. It was it was shortly into the Trump presidency, the spring of 2017. I thought that's the movie, the relationship between the master Roy Cohn and Mm -hmm. his apprentice, Donald Trump. You know, it's funny. I I I I think that Roy Cohn is an underappreciated aspect of of politics beyond just just Trump but you mm-hmm. caught in this that dynamic of of those echoes that came through even today the exaggerations the lying the setting off a new controversy to get out of an old controversy all totally. of that talk to us about how he and Cone first intersected well um the movie begins in 1973 when Donald Trump uh meets uh Roy Cone at an exclusive New York uh, City nightclub. Donald Trump at the time was in his late 20s and he was um, unhappily a a rent collector for his father's um, Brooklyn and Queens real estate um, company. And the Trump family was being sued by the Justice Department for housing discrimination. Uh, Donald's father was a a notorious racist and um, was sued for, um, uh, he was uh, sued for refusing uh, to rent to black tenants. and so the Trump family was being uh, pressured by their lawyer to just settle the suit. And Donald Trump meets Roy Cohn at this nightclub and tells him about the lawsuit. 
And Roy Cohn says, don't settle, just sue the government, file a countersuit, create a counter narrative. And that really clicked with Donald. Um, the Trump family hired Cohn um, and they ended up you know, basically winning the lawsuit. They settled for no, no financial fine and admitted no wrongdoing. Um, and from there, Roy took Donald under his wing and opened the gates of power to New York society and taught him his three rules for politics, which we see every single day on the campaign trail. And those rules are, number one, attack, attack, attack. Number two, admit nothing, deny everything. And rule number three, never admit defeat, always claim victory. And you can basically boil down Donald Trump's entire political playbook to those three. That through line is is absolutely vivid in any analysis of Trump today. Any Anytime you look at him, watch him, you know that that's where the origin story of all this, this uh, of, of his tactics comes from. So as so he, he meets Cohn and mm -hmm. and Cohn starts to shape his career. But this mm -hmm. is also a story about how what a kind of what a miserable person Donald Trump is. He's never yeah. been this the 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 character he plays to the public. Mm -hmm. He's never been as confident or as 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 brash mm -hmm. as he plays, uh, you know, to the camera. It's always there's always like an under uncertainty about this guy. And a, is it mm -hmm. is is this a story about his family as well? Like the upbringing this guy had of the this absolutely nightmare family. Yeah, no, um, that's that's a great point, Rick. You know, the the movie begins in 1973, but obviously we see the after effects of Donald Trump's childhood growing up with an abusive father, Fred Trump, and an right. alcoholic older brother, Freddie. Um, and really what this this movie shows is that, you know, Donald Trump was kind of searching for an identity. You know, when he meets Cohn, he's very awkward. Um, mm -hmm. He's insecure. You know, in this this character, you know, it's obviously I want to stress this film is is based on real events, but it is a drama. It is art. But I based, you know, my early impressions on young Donald Trump. There's this interview I recommend your your listeners go watch. It's on YouTube and it's um, Donald Trump's first national television interview from 1980. It's with um, the TV personality Rona Barrett. And you see in this video how different he is today. He's soft spoken. He's trying to be charming. He's a little bit stiff and awkward. And that, for me, was like the the starting point of who Donald Trump was. But after 15 years of being mentored by Roy Cohn, he then develops into this egomaniacal personality, um, where you know it's all this sort of media myth of the of the deal making businessman. Right, and, and Cohn is a very dark figure in American politics, mm. and and the he's dark, a guy the darkest, who, the darkest, yeah, arguably one of the darkest figures in our in our entire political history, no question. And, and so. I think Jeremy Strong in this captures him in a really kind of chilling way. This guy mm -hmm. was almost reptilian in his desire to be I mean, in I, control. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you can't play, you know, armchair psychologist, but, you know, clearly Roy Cohn was a sociopath. Um, you know, he he really, you know, practiced the politics, as I said, of personal destruction. He used extortion and blackmail um, to pressure people to do what he wants. He was famously... Um, you know, a closeted, uh, he was gay, but he was closeted and he right. actually persecuted, you know, other gay, mm -hmm. gay government officials. And he also basically taught Donald that there is no line, that basically the only line is whatever it takes to win. And I think that stayed with Trump. And, you know, Roy Cohn was a lawyer. There's this amazing quote about Roy Cohn that he was a lawyer who had contempt for the law. And I think Donald right. Trump is a politician who has contempt for the institutions of American politics. No question. No question. Uh, in this film, you see the sort of early relationship stuff that that touches on his ego and it, like the mm -hmm. liposuction, the hair transplants, all mm -hmm. that. Is Donald's physical vanity like still to this day his his Achilles heel? Because I've always heard from people around him that that is the one thing that will set him off if he looks bad on camera, if the, if the hair yeah. is wrong, if the suit doesn't look right. And this this clownish affect, though, but it really strikes me that that's one of the things that that no one's really ever gotten to him on, it, it, even though he looks oh, comical at all times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think you really are, you're onto something. You know, the movie is um, it works on many levels, but in some ways, when I when I wrote it, I imagined it. You know, it's partly a Frankenstein story where mm -hmm. Roy, Roy Cohn's the scientist and he creates the monster. 
but it's also a little bit of a Pygmalion story. Um, you know, Roy Cohn right. teach, you know, Roy Cohn was always permatanned. Roy Cohn had, you know, excessive plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. Um, there, there is a similarity of a vanity between Roy Cohn and Trump. And also I think by the end of the film, you know, the, the visual metaphor of Trump having a scalp reduction surgery and having liposuction, um, you know, it's the visual metaphor of the monster is finally being created. And I think, you know, what I hope the movie does, because it's not, you know, from the first, you know, frame of the film, it's not a political hit job. This to me, I wrote it as a character study because, you know, all of us have lived through the Trump years and just on a basic human level, how does a person like this get created? Um, and I wanted to try to write a film that would dramatize that subtle transformation from, you know, an ambitious, aggressive asshole into a megalomaniac. One of the things that captured it to me was that moment where Sebastian Stan is, he, he rings the, the, the buzzer at Roy Cohn's apartment and mm. The, the, it's such a great little piece of acting. He's so tentative, like uh, Mr. Mr. Cohn, it's 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 Donald yeah. Trump. And, and I just yeah. found that to be like, I thought I that was a that's going to get under his skin, too, because, you know, Trump has sold himself, you know, certainly to his MAGA followers, but even the Republican Party as this, you know, strong man, you know, def, you know, defiant leader. And I think mm -hmm. seeing him insecure and nervous is such a uh, punctures that that myth in a way that I don't think you know he ha he he I don't think he likes to pretend that that version of himself ever existed. He wants to think that he wants his followers to think he came out of you know the womb as this fully formed strongman, and this is clearly an identity that he has found. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. I, this the idea that he was created in some way I think is is probably pretty offensive to him. So. They have tried to stop this film. They they certainly mm -hmm. went at it and tried to uh, and tried to push back against its release. Talk to us a little bit of how that's worked out for them. Yeah, I mean that's a whole. My my friends joke that that's like a movie inside of a movie. Um, yeah, no, it's been a it's a saga. The movie comes out uh, tomorrow, Friday, uh, October 11th. Yep. Um, but for months this summer, it looked like the movie was never going to be released. Um, we had our world premiere at the Cannes Film Festival at the end of May, and Trump's campaign you know, without even seeing the film, you know, released this scorched earth statement, you know, following Roy Cohn's playbook, they went on the attack. Um, they called it, you know, malicious di disinformation, foreign election interference, um, and, and a whole other bunch of um, bullshit. But, you know, the, 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 the legal threats had the intended effect of um, basically making every major Hollywood studio um, run away from this movie and be afraid to, to pick it up. So we were without a distributor, without any way to get this movie into either theaters or onto a streamer. Mm -hmm. um, and on top of that, we had a financier. Um, our main our main investor is the son-in-law of the Republican billionaire Dan Snyder, um, <laughs> uh, former owner of the Washington Redskins, then Commanders. He um, Dan Snyder hated the movie. His son-in-law ended up hating the movie. And so they were fighting us. They didn't want us want the movie released. So we had to raise seven million dollars from investors to buy first buy him out and then mm -hmm. find a small distributor who had the guts to take it on. So we were fighting really this multi front battle to get the film released. And it had its um, a North American premiere in August at the Telluride Film Festival. Yep. And I remember my wife and I booked our tickets to go, not even knowing if the film was going to be legally allowed to be shown. And at the 11th hour, the lawyers made a deal and we got, you know, we got the control of the movie. And um, now it's free to be released nationwide. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of coverage in the media about the struggle of this movie to be released. So I'm really trying to hammer home to 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 people that this movie will be in in movie theaters nationwide. It's now, you know, wherever you live within, you know, 10 or 15 minute drive, there will be a movie theater where you can see it. So, you know, we've put that hurdle behind us. Well, that's good news uh, because I do think it's an important film. And, and I think I think it's interesting because. The zone of Trump is flooded with so much myth making about who he is. Mm -hmm. um, and and my first real encounter with that was way back when I worked for uh, it was working in the 2016 race for a super PAC. I went to a big donor in New York and I worked in New York and I still didn't know that Trump wasn't anything mm -hmm. like he was portrayed. I said to the donor, I'm like, look, he's a billionaire. He could self fund even 100 million, 200 million dollars. It's going to be a real problem. 
And the guy leans back. He goes, Donald's not a billionaire. Yeah. He's a clown living on credit. Yeah. And, and as I started to dig at then and, and when writing two books about it, I felt uh, that you keep peeling back the revelations about how little there is really there underneath it, except okay. that bundle of insecurities and, and, well, and his that, daddy's and his dad's money, you know, really right, it is right. His, you know, all of his deals and there's a scene, you know, and I hope you tee up our interview with spoiler alerts, but there's a scene near, near the end of the film, which is, which is based on a real event where, um, Donald is being hounded by creditors. He's trying to build the Taj Mahal casino in mm -hmm. Atlantic city. He's totally over leveraged. And he goes to his father who's um, dying of Alzheimer's. He's completely right. out of it. And basically, Donald tries to swindle his own father into giving him control of the family trust um, so that he can pay back his creditors. And that, to me, really is the essence of the Donald Trump business career, right? It's a total house of cards, but he right. always fails upwards because he had this family money. That $414 million came in very handy for him uh, over yeah. the years. It certainly... And I also... One other point I want to make is... Um, you know, this movie is a character study of, you know, what happens when somebody sacrifices their morality for the pursuit of power. And, you know, Donald, when we meet him, you know, he's in the start of the film, he's still s somewhat tethered to reality. He is a human being. Mm -hmm. And I think under Roy Cohn, he learns that y there are no rules. You can do whatever you want to anybody if it gets ahead. And I think that's, you know, for me, that was what was, I think, the most disturbing is to really internalize this this feeling that Donald Trump could become president and he's somebody that is just a complete moral vacuum. I mean, there's no humanity right. left in this person. And you see it sort of disappearing in the movie. You see it sort of, yeah. you know, the, the trade-off is is, you know, and this the very traumatic scene in the film of of his his rape of Ivana, um, that doesn't it, 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 and there, it, it doesn't seem to have remorse or, mm -mm. or, or to, to affect him. And that, by the way, another great piece of acting in that moment. Um, yeah. but it, it, it just strikes me that that, that, that the inclusion of that scene telling that story, um, was one more moment where you really understood that there was nothing left after he bought into this devil's bargain with code. No, I mean, yeah. And, and uh, you know, that, that scene is obviously very brutal and, it was difficult to write and difficult, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. to watch. And I think the actors and the, the filmmaker handled it, you know, I think with subtlety and respect. But, you know, I think that scene dramatizes that this is what somebody would do to the person who he's the closest to that he's supposed to love the most. Mm -hmm. And when she threatens his masculinity, his response is to just destroy her. Um, and, uh, you know, that scene is based on Ivana's 1990, uh, 1990 right. divorce deposition, um, you know, which she later clarified that she it wasn't criminal, as you know, but, you know, and then she when Trump was running for president, walked it back further. Um, but I felt that that scene was emotionally true, that her first statement is, was the most emotionally accurate um uh, mo most accurate rendering of who Trump was at that time. Right. I think that I think that's the case. I mean, uh, well, as I said, I think what you've got, you got your finger on the pulse of was was you wrote around this 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 moral vacuum, as you called it correctly, I think, um, and, and showed people that it wasn't just it's not just today. This is all, but this has been what he has been now for almost 60 years. Yeah, this is the character he's been or the lack of character he has for almost 60 years. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's, um, and that's where I kind of also feel like the film sheds some new light that it's, yes, Roy Cohn was, uh, I argue, you know, the film dramatizes that Roy was Donald's biggest influence, but um, the film also explores how Donald was the product of a culture and a system. And in that way, you know, myself as a reporter and a member of the media, you know, take some responsibility for that. I think you know, Roy taught Donald how to manipulate the media and use television and use gossip columns to, right. you know, build up this myth. Um, and so the the movie is is also kind of an indictment of when you, what happens when politics becomes entertainment. And um, and so I think it's a cautionary tale also just for America. That's a, that's a really interesting point, because he's always been a creature of page six. Um, and folks, if you don't know, page six is the gossip column in the New York Post. 
every day. Um, but he's always been a creature of page six, you know, even dumping his own stories there, trying to, you know, spin him, spin himself to them under these assumed names, all this, all this. And I find it fascinating that in the era of social media, he couldn't have gotten away with it, but he's also very much a successful creature in the era of social media. It, it is, an, it is a format that he's shockingly good at. Um, yeah, it, but I, I think that also is a testament to Roy's influence because uh -huh. Roy had a very vivid and colorful style of speaking. You know, when when Roy was being disbarred by the New York Bar Association in the mid 80s for unethical behavior, <laughs> you know, he called the the New York Bar Association a bunch of yo-yos and bozos and clowns. And, right. you know, the politics, you know, kind of the ad hominem attacks. And, you know, that's that way of speaking, it's, it's funny. I mean, I think Roy actually had a very sharp and, 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 um, specific sense of humor. And I think Donald does too. And that's why I think social media was a good format for him because Donald, regardless of what you think of him, he is an effective communicator and he sure. speaks in a way that gets people to pay attention. And that was also another lesson of Roy's. Well, I think, I think that this is uh, a movie that folks should go out and see. I think that it is it is it is an insight into Trump that that is valuable, especially at this moment. Um, one last question for you, Roger yeah. Stone, sort of mm -hmm. the, what I call who I call the dollar store Roy Cohn, um, sort of rose up to take Roy's place in mm, some yeah. attenuated way. He was never quite Roger's own bullshit has never been quite met the myth of Roger, but Cohn really was that evil, really was that manipulative. Um, it, it, it did was Trump just attracted because he needs that that sort of devil on his left shoulder figure in his life? Yeah, that's really smart that you you mentioned that because um, there's a character who plays Roger Stone has a cameo in the in the film. And right. when I was writing it, the the intent the intention of the Roger Stone character was to show how as Roy got sick and was um, dying of AIDS and he was also being hounded by the IRS and the uh -huh. FBI, Donald you know, he was less useful to Donald. And then Roger Stone kind of enters and takes that, fills that role. Right. Um, and yeah, I think Donald and it, uh, Donald needs these, um, you know, these people around him who will basically never, ch you know, challenge his unethical behavior. You know, I think Michael Cohen in a, in a, in a later life ended up playing that role as well. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, none of them seem to have measured up, you know, what's the famous line that, that Trump said when he was um, being investigated, uh, where's my Roy Cohn? Um, right. And there's part of me that sees him and, and you know, thinks that he still wishes that, you know, Roy's been dead for 40 years, that, um, you know, the ghost of Roy Cohn could talk to him. <laughs> I bet he does. I bet he does. Well, Gabriel, I know you are out of time and uh, I want to let you get going. Uh, thank we you, will Rick. put a spoiler alert at the front of this show, uh, but thank you so much for coming on the on the yeah, podcast today. One other and, thing that um, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. people can go to um, www.theapprenticemovie.com and no matter where you live, you click on the link to buy tickets and it will show you a local theater. So that was um, my next question. <laughs> spread, the, spread the word, please. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Gabriel, thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks, I really Rick. appreciate you. We'll talk to you again soon. Okay. Good luck.